Thank you very much for watching this talk. My name is Michael uh, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And in this talk, um, I want to share a few recent features that we've added to our solver Cosmo. And this is joint work with my two supervisors, Paul and Mark. So just a quick recap about this package. Um, it's a solver for convex conic problems. So problems that can be written in this form. You're trying to minimize a convex uh, objective fun function or loss function or cost function subject to certain uh, conic constraints that can be written uh, in this conic form here. And the intuition is that you're just trying to find uh, a vector x that minimizes this red function and you might have certain constraints. Um, for example, that x has to be higher than this value here. And in this particular case, the optimizer could be found at the intersection point. Um, but lots of nonlinear constraints can be written in this form if you can find a convex uh, cone to describe the constraint. And in particular, most convex optimization um, classes such as LPs, QPs, and SDPs can be written in this form. And so this allows us to solve problems from all kinds of applications um, using this solver. We also provide interfaces to the modeling frameworks Jump and ConvexJL, and that allows the user to describe his optimization problem easily, and then it's passed to our solver to solve the problem. I just want to briefly um, talk about the algorithm that is used inside our solver. We're using the alternating direction method of multipliers, or ADMM. And for the purpose of this talk, you can think of this um, algorithm just as a kind of black box function G that takes a solution estimate vector V and performs some opt uh, operations and then returns a new vector VK plus one. And two years ago, I've given a presentation about um, ADMM that is going into more details. But for this presentation, I just want to briefly highlight the main linear algebra operations that are happening in the solver. Um, so when you set up the problem, the first thing that is done is a factorization step um, of a constraint matrix. So this matrix um, has the dimension m plus m, and you just perform this factorization once at the beginning. And then until you converge the main operations that you do are a back substitution step based on um, your input vector v that gives you this vector x and then based on this input vector x you perform a projection onto your constraints cones or cone and if you choose the cone to be um, the non-negative orthant then you can model lps and qps and your projection step will be very fast uh, if you're trying to solve an stp your cone will be uh, the positive um, semi-definite cone and the projection will involve finding the eigenvalues of your input matrix x in this case and this will be very um, expensive if the matrix has a very large dimension and then your output vector is just a combination of these um, intermediate results the advantages of ADMM and the reason why we've chosen this algorithm is that it's scaling very well for large convex problems and it's also decomposable. And we're going to use this later um, for some improvements in the computation. Uh, one of the disadvantages of, in general, first order optimization methods is the slow convergence to high accuracy solutions. And we're going to talk about uh, acceleration methods uh, on the following slides. Uh, so I've um, taken a look at the git log output um, of our repository since I've given uh, since I've presented the solver um, two years ago and the main upgrades that we've done since then is um, clique merging and multi-threading for decomposable SDPs, efficient model updates and safeguarded NS and acceleration to improve convergence. And in this presentation I want to talk about the NS and acceleration and the clique merging. If you're interested in the model updates I encourage you to take a look at the um, documentation here where um, the model updating is explained. So Anderson Acceleration is a general framework to speed up first order optimization algorithms. And again, in this presentation, just uh, assume that our ADMM algorithm is represented by this 
function g here. And we also define another function f, which is just the residual, so the uh, input minus the output vector. And if this residual goes to zero, then uh, we know that we've converged. And now Anderson acceleration works in the following way. At each step, you choose this parameter m, which is um, the number of historic iterates you want to consider in, in the scheme. So let's say you want to consider the three last um, iterates. And then you choose um, weights alpha here, that's sum to one, and you recombine the outputs of the ADMM algorithm um, using these weights, and that gives you the next iterate. And now the difficult question is uh, how to choose these weights, and Anderson suggested it uh, suggested to do it in the following way. He suggested to minimize the weighted sum of previous residuals, um, subject to the constraint that this is an affine combination. Um, so if you want to think about it in terms of this figure, consider these last three residual vectors. Uh, you want to find the alphas to combine those vectors in order to create a new um, vector that is close to zero. And then you are using these alphas to combine the previous function outputs and you hope that this um, gets you closer to the solution. Um, in practice this works really well for many different um, first order optimization algorithms but in general you cannot get any convergence guarantees and you might even run into numerical problems. So people usually wrap this acceleration method into a safeguarding scheme. And this is also what we do in Cosmo. Um, so what we do is we have this Anderson acceleration function and that takes into account previous iterates and returns a new iterate here, some candidate point for the acceleration. And now before we accept this point, we want to um, check the quality of this point. And we do this by computing um, the residual for this candidate point. And then we take the norm of the residual as the quality of this point. And only if it's smaller than um, this parameter tau times the previous residual, uh, we will accept the point. If the point is not good enough, we simply forget about the acceleration and we perform a normal step. So we just perform a normal ADMM step here. Um, considering this portfolio optimization problem here as an example, um, where you're trying to find a new asset allocation. So it's say X is a vector of 50 different shares um, and you have a previous allocation X zero and you're trying to find a new allocation. Um, so this objective is simply saying uh, maximize the return. So um, this vector here has expected returns while minimizing the risk of the new allocation and sigma here is a covariance matrix. And this um, parameter gamma here is just a kind of um, tuning knob to um, balance risk and um, return. And then we have the constraint that the new allocation, the sum of the new allocation has to be equal to the cash that we're holding plus the previous allocation. And in this example, we only allow um, um, positive allocation, so no short selling. Uh, we can solve this problem um, in jump and use Cosmos the solver. And I'm just generating some random problem data here for the returns and for the covariance matrix. And now I'm setting up the problem um, in jump. So you can see here, I'm creating a new optimizer for jump and I'm passing in Cosmo as the optimizer. And in this example, I now um, first want to solve this problem without any acceleration. So I'm just passing in an empty accelerator and I want a solution of 10 to the minus 5 accuracy. Okay, now I can um, create this jump model and um, create the variables for this model. Um, this objective function here, where we have the returns here, the first term, and the um, risk here. And then we have the constraints, and we can solve um, this optimization problem. And if you look at the output of the solver, you can see it tells you no acceleration was used here. And it takes um, 
about 600 iterations to converge and about 3.4 seconds. And now I'm trying to solve the same problem but with an accelerated solver. So I'm reconfiguring um, the optimizer. So I'm passing in Cosmo here. And now as the accelerator, I choose an endless accelerator and I want to consider 15 previous iterates at each step. I'm also turning the safeguarding on um, to make the solver more robust. And in fact, this is actually the standard configuration of Cosmo. You can go into uh, more detail and um, choose many, many different variants of Anderson Accelerator. And we've implemented a few different variations in the package uh, Cosmo Accelerators, uh, which you can find up here. Okay, now we set the solver again and we optimize this and solve the same problem again. And you can see it tells you a bit more about the accelerator that's used. This is a type two Anderson acceleration, uh, restarted memory. And you can see this problem is solved within um, roughly 200 iterations and uh, 1.7 seconds. It also tells you that um, 47 iterations were safeguarded where we've actually discarded the accelerated step. I want to show you some benchmark results for the accelerated solver. So in total, we've benchmarked more than 600 different problems from these six problem sets. And the graph shows you the mean number of iterations within each problem set. And you can see that uh, the reduction is usually more than 50%, um, sometimes even up to 80% reduction. And this graph shows you um, the reduction in solve time. Um, you have to kind of distinguish here for the kind of smaller problem sets, so problem sets with smaller QPs, the reduction is not as high, but for STPs and large QPs, you get um, speed ups of more than 50% and um, even more than 75% in some cases. It's also interesting to note that um, the time spent on um, finding the accelerated point is less than 25% for QPs and less than 3% for STPs. So for STPs, it's, it's almost for free. Next, I want to talk about clique merging and multi-threading for decomposable STPs, because that allows you to solve extremely large um, STPs. An STP is shown here. Um, the decision variables in this problem are the vector Y and the matrix S. So we're trying to maximize this linear cost function um, subject to these equality constraint and then we have the conic constraint that S is positive semi-definite. So that means um, it can only have non-negative eigenvalues. And as I said earlier, this is really the problematic constraint here, because if N is um, 10,000, then projecting this takes 10,000 to the power of three operations. Um, but as you can see, we've added some additional information here. And this just, this just states that we know where the zeros are for S. And we know this because uh, we look at the sparsity pattern of, of all the AIs and C, and if they have zeros in these places, then S will also have zeros in these places. We don't know the values of the non-zeros, but we know where the zeros are. And we can equivalently present, represent this uh, sparsity structure by a graph like this. So we add edges between nodes that have a non-zero entry. And now what we do is we try to find um, consistent subblocks in this uh, sparsity pattern, which we call cliques. So cliques are subsets of vertices where all the vertices are connected to each other. And I'm gonna show you a few for this example. So this one is one, two, six. You can see uh, one, two, and six, they're all connected to each other. And you can also see how this somehow represents one of the subblocks of this matrix. This is another one, two, three, and four. And this is another one, four, five, and six. And now there's a really nice uh, theorem called Eigler's theorem that allows us to um, solve an equivalent problem. So we're not solving this problem, we're solving instead this problem here. And you can see the difference between the two is that now we have three conic constraints, but the constraints are on much, much smaller blocks. So this is just a um, three by three block and they're all just three by three blocks. And now you can imagine if this is a large matrix of size 10,000, but you have lots of small blocks, then um, solving this problem is much, much uh, easier. An important thing to understand is that you don't have to stop here with this initial decomposition. You can actually 
combine these cliques back together. This is called clique merging. And you might want to do this if um, cliques overlap a lot, because then it might not, not necessarily make sense to decompose them. But let's look at a few uh, examples. So here on the left, you can see the ideal case. Imagine you have a very large matrix and all the blocks are neatly arranged on the diagonal and they only overlap in one entry. So then you could just, instead of solving um, a problem with this big matrix, you have lots of small blocks um, and you would be able to solve this problem much, much quicker. In the middle, we have the worst case scenario. So here you have um, only two cliques and they uh, uh, overlap almost entirely. You can see that here. So uh, if you would decompose this problem, then you would make a problem twice as hard to solve because now you have two very big blocks. And then obviously in reality, you might have a complicated sparsity pattern like this, where it's absolutely not obvious how to combine any of the cliques. And the question is, is there a smart way of um, figuring out which cliques to combine and which cliques um, to leave? In Cosmo, we use a new clique graph based merging strategy. So for a example sparsity pattern like this, with the non zeros shown here, we first figure out the cliques. In this example, we have five different cliques. And then we put edges between these cliques and um, between cliques that are allowed to be merged. And this is called the reduced clique graph. And the next step is to put a weight on every um, edge between cliques. And the weight just represents um, how much time can be saved by merging the two cliques together. So if it's a large value, we want to merge the cliques. If it's a negative value, we think um, we shouldn't merge the cliques. And then we just traverse this graph and combine cliques that have the highest value. So in this case, clique five and clique three should be merged. Um, you can see I've, I've colored it here in the sparsity pattern. There's a large overlap in these entries and we just update <clears throat> our sparsity graph and our um, clique graph here. And then we just recombine these edge weights. Um, and in this example, we now only have negative values, so we will stop merging um, and solve the problem based on this sparsity pattern. Yeah, so in this example, I'm solving an STP again with this problem form here. And I'm just loading some random data for A1, A2, and C and B. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm plotting the combined sparsity pattern. And you can see here that the sparsity pattern has um, a 50 by 50 block on the diagonal, a slightly overlapping 50 by 50 block in the middle, and then actually two 50 by 50 blocks. So these are two 50 by 50 blocks overlapping almost entirely, except for one um, column. And the whole matrix is 149 by 149. And now I want to solve this in jump and use Cosmo. And for now, I've set this optimizer to not use any decomposition. So we just completely forget about all the sparsity. And this is how I set it up in jump. Um, this is the cost function, linear cost function, and the um, conic constraint here. And I can solve the optimization problem. And one thing I'm doing here is I'm computing how long it takes to do the projection for the matrix block um, at, at each iteration. So at each iteration, how long does this projection step take? And now let's run this. Um, you can see the solver output here. We have uh, one constraint of, one, of dimension 149 by 149. So we don't do any decomposition here. And you can see it takes um, 700 iterations, roughly five seconds, and the mean projection time is four milliseconds. So four milliseconds for one projection. And now I want to use decomposition. So I'm setting the decomposition setting to true. And I'm not going to do any merging for now. So I'm just going to use the initial decomposition. And I'm, I'm leaving everything else the same. I'm just rerunning this now. And you can see the solver output now tells me that the problem has been decomposed. We have now four PSD cones of size 50 by 50. And so you can see that. Um, it took the two top ones and then the two that were overlapping in the corner are also separated as um, two um, individual ones. And you can see that uh, this is solved a lot quicker in 1.7 seconds and the mean projection time is about 2.1 milliseconds here. 
Okay, now the last exercise here is to use um, the clique merging. So I'm passing in a clique graph merge here. So use this clique graph merge strategy. I'm going to rerun this. And again, if you look at the output, we can now see that we have a um, problem with three PSD cones and one of them is 51 by 51. So that is just a combined 50, the two 50 by 50 blocks that overlap. And you can see that this is solved um, in under a second and we have a mean projection time of roughly 1.57 milliseconds. And these differences in projection time um, don't seem like much, but if you have very large STPs, uh, you might have a couple of seconds Per iteration and you might do a thousand iterations so this can actually uh, add up very quickly so let's go back to um, some benchmark results uh, here are just a few sparsity patterns of our benchmark sets so they're very complicated um, between 500 and 21 million non-zeros and this plot shows you for different problems so different stp problems here from benchmark sets how long does the projection time take at each iteration? And I've grayed out a couple of uh, configurations that I don't want to talk about in this presentation, but the main ones to focus on are the blue ones who don't do any merging. And the red one is our key graph based merging strategy. And you can see uh, you get always a speed up um, for the projection time and the mean reduction and projection time is 30% and best case 60%. And we've also benchmarked our solver against a couple of other solvers that don't use the decomposition uh, and clique merging. So in this case, we're combining, uh, comparing Cosmo with clique merging, decomposition and multi-threading against MOSEC and SCS. And you can see that you, in red, you can see the fastest solver in each row. So you can see the most problems, um, Cosmo is able to solve the problem uh, as the fastest solver. Uh, but the interesting bit are the really, really big problems here on the right. They all have more than a million non-zeros. And you can see that if you don't do decomposition or clique merging, um, you might not be able to actually keep the problem in your, in your memory or you might take um, several hours to solve it. Whereas with our decomposition, you can solve it within a um, couple of seconds. Yeah, to conclude this presentation, um, Anderson Acceleration works really well to um, solve uh, larger convex problems to higher accuracy solutions. Um, this is now used by default in Cosmo. And also the combination of causal decomposition, clique merging and multi-threading allows us to solve very large SDPs. And actually the acceleration and um, the clique merging and causal decomposition also work together. Uh, future ideas are to um, add GPU support for Cosmo and also integrate um, model updates more intelligently with jump. So if jump gets an updated model, um, what steps of the solver could be reused to save time? Um, if you have any questions, please um, post them in the conference discord. You can also contact me directly. Um, you can find the details on my website. I also encourage you to take a look at our documentation um, that explains all these topics in more detail or look at our recent um, publication on the topic and uh, thank you very much for your attention.